my name is Belinda Tato. I am an associate professor in practice of landscape architecture at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. And I am also director, uh, together with Jose Luis Vallejo, my partner, uh, of uh, our firm Ecosystem Urbano, which is based in Madrid and here in Boston. So I'm going to be presenting some of our work. I, I thank you, uh, the university, for the invitation. I'm very pleased to, to be here, even if virtually. I'm going to be just in a few days there. So I'm, I will be sharing a screen. Just give me a second. Okay, so I understand you can see my screen all right, right? Okay, so as I said, my name is Belinda Tato. Our firm is Ecosystem Urbano, which stands for Urban Ecosystem. And I will be talking first about our methodology of work, how we approach urban issues. Uh, and then I will illustrate this kind of methodology and approach through four different projects, uh, two of them in Europe, one in China and another one in the United States, in the area of Florida. So the first thing that I would like to say is that um, we started our practice in the year 2000. We had the fortune to be working in different parts of the world, and this has exposed us to different um, climates, contexts, uh, social and economic contexts, and environmental conditions. So this is, um, I like to say that it's a, a whole continuous learning journey because every single project is a different challenge and we really need to understand the local conditions, the local context, the local people to be able to operate in them. So I would also like to start with this kind of powerful quote, uh, design has the power to transform the world. Um, I don't know how many designers are in the room, but design or the transformation of reality do, does really have the capacity to change people's lives. Because design can transform reality, can change mindset, can shape behaviors, can impact people's lives, can definitely contribute to creating equity in a city or in an urban environment, and it can change the future. Therefore, design is political. And I like to also emphasize this among my students usually because we're not kind of neutral professionals that just have to kind of um, um, believe or do the work that we're um, you know, commissioned uh, for. We do have a political standing and we, uh, I, I, every piece of work that we do is a statement. Okay, And I think that is extremely powerful. So let us transform the world. So from this perspective, when I was a student in the 90s, um, I was educated as a, as a designer, as an architect, as an urban designer, but in a way that, um, you know, it was very much the idea or the concept that we would work individually and it would be kind, kind of our original ideas and unique ideas, um, the, you know, the, um, the way that we would operate in the world. Throughout the years, over the last 22 years in which I've been working, I realized that it's not so much a single idea or a single mind, but it's mostly uh, a network of ideas and a network of, uh, of people with different disciplines. Because urban issues are extremely complex and usually it's not just a single idea that needs to be addressed or the way that we to solve them. So I've been working on projects that relate to awareness, to management, to technology, to behavioral change, to landscape in every possible scale, to education, to place making, making and, and, and many other tools. So this idea that, you know, again, even if I was trained just as a designer, I've been trying to, to incorporate all these different methodologies and tools, and I needed to, to address urban issues and urban topics. So regarding methodology, I will be speaking about these 10 points. The first one is about exploring. The second one is about research. The third one is network. The fourth one is about sharing. The fifth one is about openness. The sixth one and the seventh one are relating because it's about thinking big, but starting small. So cities should never get paralyzed by the fact that they don't have enough resources because it's always the case. So we should have always a kind of a global vision, an urban vision, a future vision for our environment. Although maybe we cannot implement it fully uh, you know, in one single state. The eighth one is act now. So again, we should never get paralyzed by realities and challenges. It's always challenging to do anything. The ninth one is about communication. We also embrace um, you know, communication with the community. Like we really think it's not again a top-down approach. We have to get people excited about the transformation of the urban environment. 
And the 10th the one is about beyond, beyond architecture, beyond design. Okay? And I will go through all of them. So the first one, so again, because I was trained in the designer, uh, the exploration that we were um, educated for, it was a physical exploration. It was about understanding the physical context. And again, throughout these years, I develop a, a a true or honest interest in the social component. So we not only have to explore the physical environment to react to it, we have to understand the social environment to be able to design it, design physical space. So again, we've been trying to develop, acquire the different tools for all the physical um, mapping, per se, but also the social mapping, how to understand how people move, how people feel in the space, which is not so quantitative, but is more qualitative. The second point is about research. We're never experts enough. Every single project, and I like to say that to my collaborators, to the people who work with me in my office, to my students, every single project that I've faced in my life has some sort of research and has some sort of knowledge that I need to acquire. We never repeated solutions. And also, even if we wanted to repeat a solution, the, the, the context and the environments and the challenges were different, so we had to develop new tools, new ideas. So we do need um, the capacity and the ability to research in no matter what space or in no matter what um, you know, expertise. So as I was saying before, from Google Maps, from understanding the physical reality and the physical context of a space, Twitter maps, how people feel about the space, how, you know, what is the likability of the space, how, how certain environments, certain spaces, certain areas in the city make people more happy or less happy. And I think this, this idea of kind of embracing how people feel in the space is still to be developed. Like we don't have maybe the appropriate tools to do so, but I think, you know, because of the technologies, we will be able to do so in the, in the short time. The third one is about the network. As I was saying at the beginning, we don't work on our, uh, on our own. Like we are architects and urban designers, but we collaborate with um, botanics, with um, um, landscape designers, with anthropologists, with sociologists, with engineers, with uh, people, professionals of communicators and journalists. So again, because we want to kind of, again, because complex uh, projects are complex and, and a little more, um, they're not so straightforward, they require different points of view, they require different methodologies. We really need to create this kind of a network. And, and again, today, because we have the capacity to communicate as we're doing right now with people from all over the place, we don't have to rely only on the local uh, collaborators or, or contributors, we can create a, a global network and that is extremely powerful. About the sharing, so we also believe in the open data. Um, the future can only be open. And, and the only way to empower people is to actually give in access to this, to this data. So again, how can, how can our work, even if it is, you know, let's say sometimes private, how can it become more public, more open and more accessible to everyone? And uh, in terms of sustainability and efficiency, uh, in terms of, um, in the resources management, we really make uh, need to make this data available and open to everyone. Be open. Uh, as I was saying before, we've been working on participation processes for the last 15 years. And this openness is about trying to improve the projects, trying to improve the solutions that we're kind of working on for the city with the inputs and the feedback from the community. We don't believe we can do a top-down approach to solve, you know, the future of the city. It has to be a bottom-up, and we have to kind of, uh, you know, try to find the middle point to, ex to you know, to, to, to create this kind of um, efficient communication and exchange of information with the community. So, in this sense, um, we have created, of course, a number of participatory projects, but also we created a digital platform, which is this one. These are screenshots from the platform, which is uh, called Local In, and it is open now for anyone in the world to use it. And the idea is to create this platform where people can leave their comments, 
their ideas, their expectations for the city. And we work with um, two different colors, very simple, red for the problems and blue for the opportunity. And it is a way to not only kind of gathering information for us, useful for our work in the cities that we work, but also to create a repository of ideas that will remain among the community so that they can, you know, take the lead, they can continue the research, they can, they can continue to understand the local conditions for them. The Think Big, again, you know, of course, we all want to do um, big projects, we all want to change reality in the best possible way, but sometimes, or most times, cities, governments, communities don't have all the resources that are required for doing these huge transformations. And my learning and, and my thinking is that we should never, never get stopped or limited by that. We should just try to find an opportunity to start the process, to start the transformation process. And I like to think that actually design and urban transformation can become a catalyst for a larger process. So it's always important to give them the client, the community, the government, the opportunity, the idea of one small intervention that can trigger a bigger change and bigger transformation. So these are some images of projects that you will see afterwards about the Think Big approach. Again, you know, we want to do everything, <laughs> the landscape, the architecture, the engineering, the digital components, but also sometimes we cannot do. So the start a small portion is like, what happens if we cannot demolish completely the street? What can we do on top of it? How can we start kind of creating layers of complexity, layers of transformation that again, as I was saying before, can start triggering a social transformation, an economic transformation, an environmental transformation. So again, we can also change reality and we can also have an impact in the long term, even if we're doing something in the short term with the small interventions. And I like this idea, the power of it. So as a little sample, this was um, a workshop that we did with the students in Paraguay, and they had been complaining about, you know, the inability of the city to implement the, the, the bike lanes. But all of a sudden, they realized that actually this was an action that they could take on themselves. So, you know, that day, you know, they got the brushes and they started to, play, to paint this and they created more than eight uh, kilometers of bike lanes throughout the city. So it was an extremely powerful uh, action because they, first of all, they became empowered. They realized they, you know, they have the capacity to change the future, not only the future, but also the present of their cities. But also um, the next morning, um, this intervention was in the, in the press as an anonymous action and they became, well, they became very proud of it. So this idea that again, you know, instead of also having the huge plan to do the perfect bike lines with all the infrastructure, with all the cones, with everything, with the lighting and everything else. What happens if something a little a little more simple can can be done so that actually this can trigger a change? As a matter of fact, the city started to take this more seriously and they approved um, a budget to do it, um, you know, completely. So you know, because they realized that people were kind of very excited about it. So the act now, you know, connected to that is like, again, let us not waste time. There's so many things that we can do in cities to improve um, the living conditions that we should just, uh, you know, get active. And I like to show this image. This is an image from a project that we did in Norway um, for which we also did a publication afterwards. And the idea is like, you know, the tools of the architects are not just the computer or the printer. You know, we have many more tools and we can start changing the space, changing the, you know, the environment immediately with our own hands. So this is, um, we were in the whole process of um, redesigning a public space and we invited the art collective Boamistura and they came and in just two days they transformed this amazing parking lot into uh, a beautiful pattern. So this idea of, you know, pain can also, you know, have an impact in the way that people started to use this space. Even if it was a temporary action, it was extremely powerful. We organized a lunch for everybody. So again, how can we 
as I was saying at the beginning, change behavior, change mindset through um, a kind of a short-term and low-tech uh, intervention. The ninth, communicate. So we have, as I said, if we want people to get excited, if we want people to participate, if we want people to, you know, to raise their voice about the future of their cities, we have to be able to communicate in different ways. We have to get people excited. We cannot just show plans and sections or drawings. Uh, we have to, you know, to find more appealing, more exciting, more contemporary ways of showing our work. So we have been doing a lot of things in that in that way. Of course, we have to improve the way we communicate among ourselves in our office uh, with our collaborators. And of course, because we do have all these technology tools, we can share information in a very efficient way, in a very visual way. But we're, we're, it's never enough. We're always exploring new ways of sharing information about the process of a project, sharing information about the inputs that we got about from participation, et cetera, et cetera. But also, again, how can we share even more with the community beyond that, beyond the professional community? So for instance, in this, you know, this is just a schedule, a timeline of a project. And also we want to show that we're doing the, both the design, but also the social. So how can we, you know, again, communicate that we're working in these two lines as parallel lines that are kind of, you know, looped together. And of course, social media is a very powerful way of uh, sharing ideas, collecting ideas, getting people to react to, to ideas. So we're always expanding our, our, you know, palette of tools and it's never enough because also there is, you know, new trends all the time in social media and, and some of the tools that we used to use, uh, they became a little bit obsolete. And then the number 10 is move beyond. So yeah, again, as I was saying, we have to become super um, active and reactive. We cannot stay quiet or, or passive, just waiting for the project to come to us, just waiting for the budgets to be there. There's so much that we can do, especially in this environment, in this condition, this current situation in which extreme heat, for instance, was in the news last summer and it was, you know, hitting all over Europe, but also it's very tough in Asia. So the, what I want to say is that there's so much that we can do already now with the knowledge that we have, with the technology that we have, and with the resources that we have that we should never get paralyzed. And, and also this idea that architecture and design is not only about doing buildings, you know, brick and mortar. There's so much, there's so many ways again to intervene. And I like this image because for me, this is also an architecture or a design. Um, is right, you know, it's, it's creating a space that it can be inhabitable. Not only that, it's also a mode of transportation. So, you know, again, there is ways to think outside the box, to to move beyond um, what we know uh, for now, and and in creativity, of course, is um, a great skill that we have to work on. So, I'm going to start um, presenting the projects. Um, I would like to say, you know, to start with these kind of three pillars. So over the last 22 years, we've been working on these three pillars. The first one is the environmental. We've been working um, creating climatic comfort in, in public spaces in cities. We've been working to improve urban ecosystems to make cities more natural. We've been working to make cities, cities more resilient in terms of uh, climate change and in terms of also social and, and economic components. Um, the second topic is technology. We are incorporating interaction and innovation into public space. And we like to think of uh, the public space as an open process that can be kind of completed by the community who uses it. And then regarding social, as I was saying before, um, I believe our work is pedagogical per nature. Uh, so there is always a component of education in every project we do. We want and we do engagement processes, as I was saying before, we try to engage with the local community in many different ways. It's not that we have a recipe for all. We're always testing new ideas and new tools. And the equity, our work definitely contributes to improve people's lives. Therefore, it brings equity to urban environment. So it's a way to rebalance the city, to give more opportunities, okay? So the four prayers that I will be presenting are touching up on these topics one way or the other. But they're always, you know, they're, you know, these these topics are always in the in the DNA of every single project, and I hope you can you get it. So the first one is a project in Madrid, 
um, it's kind of an old project, but it was very relevant in our career. So Madrid was growing a lot over the last 20 years. All these yellow areas are new developments um, led by the city of Madrid. So this red development was uh, an area that was planning for 26,000 housing units and around uh, 90,000 citizens. So as you can see here in the planning, everything is very much about this idea of living with a car and relying on the car. So compared to our more Mediterranean lifestyle, which relies on public space, pedestrian activity, you can walk everywhere or you can walk to your everyday needs. However, these new developments were very much based on the use of the car, of the car and the distances, the experience, and the sections of the streets are mainly um, considering the car experience. Okay? So this is the appearance of the buildings. Also, the, um, the blocks completely ignore the conditions of topography and orientation. It's always the same block repeated over and over. Uh, and there was this area, which has this boulevard, which is 550 meters long and 50 meters wide. So there was a department within the city of Madrid who was concerned about this type of urbanism. Um, they, and they organized a competition for this boulevard because they really thought that you know, we could do better as, as, as architects, as, as people from Madrid, in which, as I was saying, as you can see, the old fabric of the city is very organic. It's about small scale, it's about confinement, it's about, you know, um, uh, natural space, etc. So um, we got inspiration from uh, this public space in uh, Marrakesh. This is the Jemalevna uh, Plaza. And what we liked from this space is that it, it is extremely open and flexible. It's just an asphalt surface during the day, which is very, very hot, but it becomes an extremely huge restaurant you know, there's a number of pop-up restaurants uh, who serve all sort of food during the night. So this idea of flexibility, this idea of, you know, occupation, this idea of reinvention, this idea of spontaneity, we thought it was extremely powerful. Uh, the other topic that we had to deal with is the heat. So Madrid is very, very dry and very hot in the summer. So it was important to create this kind of climatic comfort. So we thought, we realized and we researched and we understood that the best way to do so was by planting uh, trees because the trees are very efficient throughout the different seasons and they can be supported for many different activities. And they are even so perfect that they can purify the air. So we got in also inspiration because we were doing research from this uh, traditional Middle East um, uh, architecture. Um, in which the air comes in this um, chimney and it goes through some wet material and it gets fresher and cooler and it creates a microclimate inside the building. So this idea that through very passive systems and very simple systems, very low tech systems, we could really lower down the temperature of the air. Uh, so with that same principle, we designed this structure with these um, um, towers in the perimeter in which we have a, a fan, so the fan is moving to, to get to suck the air in. The air gets in and it gets in contact with the water atomizers. Therefore, it becomes cooler and heavier and it comes, it comes down, creating a microclimate at the ground level. Okay? So again, this idea that um, you know, we could cool um, down the public space and that was exciting. So this is a, a rendering from the competition phase in which we were envisioning these kind of three different earth trees, as we call them. Uh, the idea was to work always with the same structure and depending on the elements that we attach to the structure, we would characterize these trees differently. So the first one in the middle is the earth tree. The one on the, on the left is the, the, play, the playground tree, the ludic tree, and the one on the right it was the media tree. So again, the idea was to create an infrastructure that people could rethink, occupy in whatever way. At that time in which we were developing the project, there was no neighbors, there was no buildings, there was only the streets as an infrastructure. And this, this project was um, co-funded by the city, but also the European Union, um, a life uh, program that they had. So it was, it was interesting because on, on the one hand, we missed the community input, but on the other hand, we were extremely free to do anything 
because it was very much an experiment. There was nothing around. So, uh, so the project happened. So we built the three structures that I was showing. One of the powerful things um, when people asked us about innovation, I think the innovation of this project is about bringing systems that are off the shelf, that are already there and use them in a different way. So as architects, we do not have the labs or the factories to produce new, new systems, new elements, right? Like you really need um, you know, a research lab or a company, like that is, that is not, that usually does not happen. So we can only rely, we can only utilize the systems that are already in place that have been tested before. So in this particular case, we were using a lot of the systems that are usually used in the greenhouse industry, which is very developed in the south of Spain. So this idea that we were grabbing elements from, from other industries, from other grounds, from other fields, to use them in a different way, to climatize public space. Okay. So um of course, all the systems are either recyclable or recycled. We wanted to kind of embed that idea in the public space. And another important asset of the project was that at that time, there was a law in Spain that forced the electrical companies to buy the electricity produced by alternative means as much as five times their selling price. So the trick is we were producing energy, we were selling it to the the network and we were buying the energy that we needed back from the network and we were making a profit of around 6,000 euros at that time, oh, sorry, 10,000 euros at that time per structure per year. And the idea was to reinvest that, you know, those resources into the maintenance of the structure. So, you know, we were very concerned in this project and we've always been with every single project about the long-term maintenance of whatever we produce. We have to be aware that cities are really struggling to keep their public spaces clean, operation, in operation, with all the systems, um, you know, with, in good condition. So it was important for us to come up with a solution that kind of, kind of guarantees some kind of resources for the future. So this is it. The interior of the, the wall uh, is, um, is all populated with uh, plants. Right now, this is, of course, an image from the very beginning. Um, the lighting systems are with uh, LED lighting. Um, the bench is also made out of recycled plastic bars. Uh, as I was saying, this is not bars that we did for this project. It's something that is already in the market. Therefore, we didn't have the opportunity to create new colors. We have to rely on the colors that are already there, but we figured it out. So this is the street before the intervention. As you can see, it's extremely dry, extremely unwelcoming. Um, and as you can imagine, in the summer, it's very tough. So the sidewalk, the, the trees, the canopy of the sidewalk was extremely poor. As you can see, then we have the um, parking lane, two driving lanes, another parking lane, another boulevard, and then the same scheme on the other side. So the, again, these neighborhoods had been conceived, planned, and built mainly for the cars without much consideration about the human experience. And we wanted to kind of re, you know, Rethink the whole space from the human experience point of view, from the human scale and from the human speed. So uh, not only we created these structures, but also we multiplied by three the number of existing trees. So the idea was to create to create this boulevard within the whole neighborhood as a more as a green area, a green belt, a green a green street, more pedestrian friendly, more for for bikes, for um, skating. For, for soft mobility. So this is the interior of the, of the tree. This is the exterior. These are some um, light test images. Here you can see the scale of the element. Um, we, we also placed a number of sensors that were, me were measuring the climatic conditions and how this was modified by the systems that I was mentioning before. And here you can see the interior wall when it was filled with ivy. There's been different moments because um, at some point it lacked total maintenance and it was um, the plants were really struggling, but now they're kind of uh, thriving again. Uh, as I was saying, one of the trees is the media tree. It's the only one that has got a structure on the top. And, um, and the idea in that media tree is it has a 360 degrees projection screen inside. And the idea is to create this kind of 
urban dining, ur urban salon, urban um, living room for people to gather to watch a game from the World Cup, for instance, or to watch mass or to do a party or to project a movie, right? So this idea of having a gathering space for the people. Here you can see this is the ludic tree. Here you can see the sidewalk, how it became embedded. So this is the original sidewalk. Of course, we didn't like the pavement, but it didn't matter. So because we didn't have the money and it didn't make any sense to redo it. So we just had to work with whatever was there. Um, we did the same with the benches. So these are the original benches. As designers, we didn't like them, but it was okay. We just repositioned them. So all this space that you see here used to be four cars. This was a parking lane and this was a driving lane. And we gained all this space for the people. And again, we added more trees. So this is the, um, the ludic trick from above. And here you can see that what used to be a crossroad where you know cars were just kind of driving by, now they have to slow down, they have to go over these um, cobblestones. They, they are aware they're coming through um, a public space. And that, of course, is discouraging any kind of um, you know um, traffic that is not you know related to this street. This is a media tree, the one that I was talking about about the screen. So as you can see, there is a helicoidal ramp, and this is kind of a bench for people to gather there to see, to watch, etc. So these are some um, lights. Um, this is when they were testing the water system. Uh, as you can see, you see the water because this is. This picture was taken in the winter, but in the summer, the water would be completely invisible because the air is very dry and it absorbs the water immediately. Okay, so these are some instances of, you know, people using the space, people organizing all sorts of events, all sorts of concerts, all sorts of, you know, competitions, etc. This is a winter picture. Uh, and then, you know, when I talk about equity, I'll talk I talk about equity in every possible way. So this is a neighborhood that all the buildings are social housing. There is a very powerful program about social housing uh, led by the city of Madrid. So they are all very quality buildings, very good. They all come from uh, architecture competitions. So there are all renowned architects doing these buildings. So it's a very, you know, the buildings are very beautiful, but they are connected to an area that is not extremely wealthy. It's a kind of a, you know, workers area. It was kind of, um, it was a little bit deprived over the 80s and the 90s. So this idea of kind of bringing architecture and design and innovation into a place that could be a little bit kind of forgotten by the city is a very interesting equity operation because all of a sudden this area has become very popular, again, not only because of this project in particular, but because of all the many architecture pieces that are in the neighborhood that actually has attracted attention from architects and designers from all over the world. So there is always people visiting this neighborhood. So, and that of course has contributed to create, you know, little cafes, little bars for people to gather there and eat there. So this idea that again, design can, you know, bring up a little bit some of the, some of the areas and create new behaviors, new trends that wouldn't happen otherwise. So, uh, this project got a number of recognitions and awards, and it has been, you know, covered by multiple media. Um, oops, sorry, sorry, I'm going backwards, sorry. Uh, and we're very proud of it. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, a couple of years ago, we sent somebody to interview the people um, living there, and they are very proud, and they all know about the climatic uh, performance of this element, etc. So they, they embrace uh, this idea of bringing innovation and bringing, you know, something that is, you know, not so common into the neighborhood and they're very proud of it. Okay, so the second project, okay, the second project is um, is in Shanghai. Um, this is, um, this is not the project, this is um, um, the pavilion from the United Kingdom. So um, the international exhibition in 2010, it was very interesting because the motto of the exhibition was better cities, better lives. And although there was amazing um, interventions in terms of pavilions, the public space and the experience of being at the expo, it was very tough. It was very tough because um, it was very hot. Um, you know, most visitors to the expo uh, was in the summer. In the summer, is the, the level of humidity is extremely high and also the temperatures are high. So people struggle to queue 
who entered the pavilions and it was exhausting. So we were invited to do uh, the public space of the Madrid pavilion. So again, our approach is like, how can we provide a public space that is comfortable climatically so that people can gather there, can rest there, can eat there before entering the pavilion or after, or, or just, you know, whatever. So we work with the engineers and they were doing simulations of how to create this kind of breeze because when the air is so humid, you need to move the air. You need to move it to create, you know, to create um, a better comfort. So they were doing some simulations by putting some uh, awnings to protect the, the, the space from the sun, but also placing um, a seven meter diameter fan in the middle. So this is how uh, the pavilion looked like. Um, the idea was to create this kind of different possibilities so that they could be used both in the day and in the night. So it has three different layers. The first one, interior one, is the projection layer. The middle one is the darkening layer. And the outside one is the, um, the sunscreen uh, layer. So this idea that it could be used as a, as a lamp in the night, as a projection, uh, or also as a space. And as I was saying, we placed this seven meter diameter fan at the top. The fan was connected to a telescopic structure so it could come closer to the ground or uh, further up, depending on the climatic conditions, because the whole there was a number of climatic sensors in the area that were informing the pavilion on how to operate and how to uh, place itself for more efficiency. So this is, um, we also designed together with the engineers, these um, uh, wind turbines. So the wind uh, in Shanghai is not very high speed, but it's very constant. So it made sense to place these wind um, um, mills. The other thing is because uh, there was not very much direct sunlight, it didn't make any sense to, to do any solar panels. So these are some um, moments of how the space was used to portray um, Madrid culture, Spanish culture, etc. Uh, but also, we also wanted to create this, you know, a piece of element of furniture that people could use and, and configure in different ways to use in different ways. So we created what we call the Madrid chair, which is this kind of plastic element that can be assembled two by two or four by four or even more, and it can be um, piled up so it can function as a seat, as a, as a, as a bench, as a cocktail table. Um, and it was interesting to see that people use it for sleeping, for resting, for eating, etc. So just gonna play a few. 世博会上的看点真是太多了，那一些带有实验性质的新生事物也不少。像本届世博会最佳城市实践区带来的最佳实践案例——空气树，它表现的是一种低碳的生活理念。It was portrayed in the, in the public television in China、um, when the when the exhibition opened. 这就是从西班牙马德里移植过来的那棵空气树，它看起来一点都不像树，但是我要告诉您呢，它的确能够像天然的大树那样，对于一个微观的局部的小气候环境产生影响。或者说的通俗一点吧，它就是一个人造的大树荫。在马德里呢，一共有三棵这样的空气树，都是建在一些新的社区里面。大家知道，在新社区里，那些树种下去长起来需要一个周期。马德里的气候又干又热，夏天的阳光特别特别的强烈。可是马德里人又偏偏很喜欢在户外聚会进行一些社交的活动，所以呢，他们就在那儿建起了这样的空气树。Okay, the third project, um, Plaza Ecopolis. So this is um an area, a suburban area of Madrid. Where most people are commuters, they live here, but they work in Madrid or elsewhere. And as you can see, the planning of the area is not extremely exciting. It's just um, you know single homes, um, paired homes uh, with their own swimming pool. And the public space in this area is not that exciting either. So this was a competition that was calling for ideas for a new kindergarten. Um, for kids between zero and three years old. So our approach was to understand that, of course, you know, we needed to deliver a kindergarten because that was the scope of the, of the competition, but we also wanted to kind of embed in the idea and the infrastructure of public space. So in such a kind of urban setting, we believe, because people are, you know, living very individually, very much on their car as, you know, 
as spending a lot of time in their car, we thought it was extremely important to provide a public space, a social space, which is very related to the education and to the building, because usually um, people gather together uh, around um, schools, like it's a social place by nature. Okay, so although there was not original budget to allocate it to you know to the public space, and there was not that it was not a priority for the city, it became a priority for us. That was the first approach. The second approach was uh, working around water. So, you know, um, we are in the south of Europe. Uh, water is an issue and it will be even worse in the coming years. Um, we, there's people who are already anticipating that, you know, the future wars will be around water as a very, very, very scarce resource. So we really thought that um, we needed to, to incorporate some sort of a recycling water um, system to, to not only recycle the water and reutilize it for the irrigation of the park, but also as a way of kind of, again, sending a message, sharing a message as an educational approach. So this is the lagoon. So we identified a company that actually works with microphy microphytes uh, plants. These plants clean the water up to a point that actually the water can, cannot be drunk, but it can be used for irrigation. And that was the whole thing. Like we wanted to create a green area, but unless we could recycle the water, it didn't make any sense to use potable water or drinkable water for the irrigation. So we are creating this, um, this um, deposit, this lagoon, for bringing in the wastewater from the building. I'm not talking about rain, I'm talking about waste from the toilets and kitchen. So it has a pre-treatment and then it is treated by the plant and it is stored underneath, underground, so that it can then be used for the irrigation. So, well, here this is just a, a diagram of the different layers of the project. So there is the topography, the landscape, and that includes the, the water feature, then the building, then the layer, the envelope of the building that kind of um, is, is, is kind of preventing the sun coming into the building, is producing the energy, et cetera. So it has a kind of a, a different kind of skin on top of it. So this is um, um, a detail of this system. So this plastic element float in the water and the microphytes get inside it. So this is a kind of a close up view. Um, and this is when the plants were just placed in the, in the little lagoon in front of the building. So of course we had to fence the lagoon because this um, deposit is like two meters um, deep. So um, I would like to emphasize something because, you know, when I, when I talk about the project, it it's all sounds like a very kind of, you know, fluid, process, easy process, but there is always a struggle and there's always, always negotiation. There is always engagement uh, behind every single technical solution. So in this particular case, of course, the city was resistant to place any kind of recyclable system. They were very concerned about the health of the kids. They were very concerned about the health of the gardeners using this water or, or you know, moving around the water. But in the end, it worked and it is working. So. Um, the, the, you know, the company had been working around this and they had all the certificates about health and all of that. So what I am saying is like, it's just impossible to implement any kind of innovation, any kind of new process, because it's about creating a new protocol, new protocol of use, new protocol of maintenance, new pr protocol of whatever. And, and it, it requires, no matter what, the involvement and the engagement of the people who ha will have to take care of this element. So in this particular case, it was the official from the city. In other cases, it's somebody else. But what I'm saying is like, you can only achieve this sort of, let's say, innovation or kind of breaking the rules or coming up with new rules in the public space or in the public realm or in whatever project, if you, if you manage to get everybody on board, everybody around the table, everybody engaged. Okay? Um, here you can see that you know, the, the area where this place, this um, project sits, is a, it's an industrial area, so it's a very rough area with a lot of traffic and noise. So we created this topography to create this kind of buffer to, to create a kind of a more safe area for the kids. So the space has become a very popular space. Here you can see how we're working with the topography to, you know, to kind of embrace this public space. But also the building is, is self, um, sorry, is half buried. So that means that it's more stable um, energetically um, uh, in terms of um, yeah, climatic conservation. So, um, so this is the building, um, different moments. 
It is interesting because the building has become popular even in the weekends when it is not open to the public. People will come here and use the you know the public space, use the swings, use the, um, the um, you know the playground. It has become popular also among the teenagers. Also, it's a kind of kindergarten, but also the topographies you know, not only served as, a, as again, as a buffer, but also they become a playful element. So this idea that one element can serve multiple purposes. So we place these um, lights. And, and again, the social component. So people kind of enjoy the project. People are aware of the significance of the project. The, you know, um, here you can see the macrophytes much more grown. Um, and then of course, again, how can we, you know, give the project to the community so, you know, if they are empowered, if they trust the project, if they like the project, no matter what happens, they will kind of fight for it. And I think uh, this is kind of, you know, the long term um, sustainability of the projects uh, as, I, as we see it. And then the fourth project is a completely different environment. This is uh, West Palm Beach in Florida in the USA. Our proposal for West Palm Beach is based on the identification of opportunities, the definition of actions and strategies, and the achievement of key improvements towards a vision of a lively urban environment. As opportunities for intervention, we consider current values and aspects that could be enacted. The social context of West Palm Beach is marked by the effect of a general seasonal migration from colder places, an event-driven flow of people from a closer context, and a weekly and daily commute from low-density neighborhoods to the downtown area, all of it in causing important fluctuations in population, economy, and urban activity, with the emergence of an even younger and more diverse population profile. Fluctuations are also present in climate, showing curves of heat, humidity, and rain that greatly influence urban activities, combined with temporary extreme weather events and the slow but steady rise of the sea level. Health is influenced by those climatic aspects and highly impacted by their surrounding urban environment. Still, West Palm Beach has a great potential for outdoor exercise and other health-related activities, reinforcing the image of the city as an ideal context for a healthy lifestyle. Mobility can greatly improve quality of life by changing a car-oriented A to B approach to one that injects life to the places along the journey, providing a more meaningful and pleasant way of experiencing the city and ensuring accessibility, safety, and comfort, developing the city's great potential for sustainable mobility. Besides mobility infrastructure, a core value of the city are its sites, including not only the many attractive, valuable places in West Palm Beach, but also the underused spaces that have great potential to bring new activities and support a more diverse urban lifestyle. Highly connected to all other aspects is urban activity, usually concentrated around several sites with much room for expansion, showing a great economic potential linked to social and climatic fluctuations, empowered by impressive event organizational capabilities. Society, climate, health, mobility, sites, and activity are the key aspects in improving the urban experience of West Palm Beach. Linking them together allows us to understand the values that can be maximized and the opportunities that can be developed for enhancing the city's quality of life. Okay, so that's a little bit of an introduction, but I will kind of explain it a bit better. So it was a competition organized by the Van Allen Institute and the city of West Palm Beach. So the competition had three different spaces for intervention. Um, so this is the, um, the, the old waterfront. As you can see, there is a very kind of rough limit, very hard and harsh limit between the city you know, the artificial kind of man-made city, but also the natural, the water. Um, also, on, on top of that, the area is extremely vulnerable to hurricanes and, you know, all these extreme events. So the competition was asking for ideas for the waterfront, which is the element that you just saw. This is the condition right now. And as you can see, you know, the heat is very extreme, especially two months a year, and there's not that much shade. You know, there's not a big canopy. So actually the waterfront, although, it could be an amazing asset of the city. It's actually very empty. There's usually very few people, except for two events. There are two events that are very, very tough in the city. So one is the, the Soundfest, which is a music festival, and the other is the boat uh, show, which is you know for people to buy boats. Um, but the rest of the year, actually, the waterfront is extremely quiet. 
The second element for the intervention was the passageways. The passageways are these kind of, you know, areas, spaces for delivery of goods, for collection of um, trash, and uh, we have seen in the movies many times, right? So they're a little bit kind of neglected and abandoned. Uh, they have the potential to become something else. And the third element was the Benny and Garage. So it was a public building owned by the city. It was a garage from the 70s, and it had the typical configuration of a garage with these ramps, uh, half ramps, half levels, etc. So the competition was extremely open-ended. They were asking like, okay, what should we do with these three elements? Just give us a program, give us an idea, et cetera. So we, our, our approach was these kind of five, um, you know, interventions or five, uh, I don't know, methodologies, renaturalize, how can we make the city more natural? How can we better connect it to the water system? How can we connect it better both within the downtown, with the neighborhood, but also uh, within the downtown itself? How can we reactivate the spaces that are completely neglected? How can we involve the citizens and how can we create climatic conditioning? So how can we improve the, you know, the, the climatic comfort? Because as I said, according to my culture, the climate is extremely mild and beautiful for let's say 10 or 11 months, or one month or two months is really tough. But actually, this is some, also something that we learned through the years climate is very cultural, so they have very little tolerance to the heat, you know. They stay indoors most of the time, although, again, to my culture, it would be totally fine. So um, this is the waterfront, and these are some of the strategies that we proposed. So the first one would be to connect these kind of passageways to the waterfront and to create a public loop. So again, enhancing the pedestrian um, um, activity, creating a pedestrian area but also connecting, you can see on the right-hand side, making the downtown more connected between itself, giving priority in some of the streets for pedestrians and for bikes, but also connecting the downtown better to the neighborhoods. Also something that I learned, again, you know, my background is from Europe. I've lived in Europe most of my life. And sometimes we take things for granted. So in Europe, usually cities are a little more um, balanced, like neighbor, there's, I mean, in general, like, you know, but here it's very extreme, like, you know, outside of the downtown where everything is pristine and new and very well taken care of, in some of the other neighborhoods, there's not public lighting, there's not sidewalks, there's not even the most basic infrastructures. So this idea of not only kind of enhancing those neighborhoods, but also how can we do an intervention in the downtown that it can really benefit the people living in the neighborhood. So this is the flagger drive, which is kind of the waterfront. And our proposal was not only to, again, intervene as a shared space um, uh, proposal, but also extending through these climatic canopies and creating this kind of in-between space between the city and the water. So the renaturalizing, how can we bring in, you know, the mangroves that for years were there and then they were removed, how can we, you know, recover them and try to create a little bit more kind of a natural experience in the waterfront? And also understanding, and you know, that all the waterfront could not have just one single solution. It will require different kind of solutions all the way through. So this is one of the moments in which we imagine this kind of, you know, climatic canopy and new kind of floating platforms on top of the of the water with the with the recovered mangroves. Uh, the idea again, because climatic comfort is is so important. How can we bring climatic comfort? And how can we induce and enhance and promote new programs in this waterfront so that people can come here to do different things and they cannot do that right now. So these are the climatic canopies in which we imagine again low tech systems as I was explaining before. And for instance, we imagine that maybe one plaza is just one pool, right? This idea that you need to refresh yourself. So how can we, you know, blend some kind of public amenities in the public space? Uh, also, this idea of people kind of, you know, interacting with the public space, configuring it different ways. Sorry. So that is the plan. How we imagine this. Um, oops. Sorry. How we imagine this intervention as a as an interface between the city and the water. The passageways. Uh, we imagine these passageways as something thematic. Like maybe there could be some some, you know, one that could be 
cultural or active or leisure. So the idea was to have a gradual kind of facing kind of transformation. But again, they do have the potential to become much more than what they are right now because they're really nothing. So this idea of kind of connecting to the existing buildings, the viewing buildings, open it up for creating new opportunities. Renaturalizing, how can we um, yeah, bring some nature into these spaces? How can we lower down the temperatures by creating some climatic um, strategies, involving the people, creating faces, etc. So these are some images of how we imagine this passageway could have you know, something built, but also green walls, but also opening up to the building buildings to create some kind of terrazas, patios, whatever. You can have an active um, passageway you know, with climbing walls, skating areas, etc. And then the third element, which is the Banyan Garage. Um, as part of the competition, we presented three options. The first one was demolishing it completely or reusing it completely or keeping half of it. Um, as the competition, we, we opted for the 100% reuse. So our proposal was to seed a new intervention, a new structure on top of the existing building. Um, this is the, how we imagine the section of this building. So the red promenade is a path. So this idea of publicness going through the building all the way to the rooftop. So there was, again, the existing garage, which is a ramp already, will be a public space that, you know, all of a sudden becomes a helicoidal ramp that goes all the way to the, to the rooftop. Okay. So, of course, all sort of strategies for the building to be sustainable, for the building to be climatically comfortable, for the building to be public and private. So although there may be some private elements, the essence and the DNA of the building will be, will be public and they, it will be accessible to everyone 365 um, days a year. So the renaturalization, how can we create a public plaza, green plaza, elevated? How can we create the communication? But again, how can we introduce into the building? To climatize it. How can we um, involve people? So we also propose a kind of a, a tech board. So this idea of entrepreneurship, uh, people with new ideas, um, education. Like for instance, one of the of the topics was how can you do some kind of workshops or or you know after school programs for the people for the kids from these kind of outside neighborhoods to have a bus that they bring them into the downtown. To, you know, to get educated and to get um, you know, about code and, and all of that. So all the climatic strategies to, you know, to protect the building from the sunlight in the day, but also to open it up in the, in the night so that it, it refers, you know, having both passive and active solutions. The rooftop and us, a public space from which you can see the whole waterfront. And this is kind of the buffer space between the existing garage and the new intervention. This idea that it could be a plaza with a food truck, open air library, uh, benches, and everything. This is an image of the, you know, behind the skin facade of the building. Again, the idea was to, you know, streamline um, the perform the energetic performance of the building. So not every space would be climatized. You could have spaces 0% climatized, 50% climatized, or 100%, depending on the programs and the requirements of these programs. Okay. So this is this idea, like you know, there could be some different ways to navigate the building, so you can have different users without you know conflicting with the other programs. Um, and and we classify the programs according to the needs, according to the schedules, but also according to the climatic um, uh, performance. This is Can we dream about video? urban atmospheres that connect us to nature? Can we imagine merging aquatic activities in urban life? Can we combine natural elements and technologies to provide climatic comfort year round? Can we create a flexible building that promotes entrepreneurship, citizen engagement, and digital interaction? Openshore creates the framework to Experience an urban wetland landscape. Enjoy the city while swimming. Discover a rainbow on a sunny day.
connect with others, and get inspired. Open Shore proposal for West Palm Beach is based on the identification of opportunities, the definition of actions and strategies, and the achievement of key improvements towards a vision of a lively urban environment. Open Shore addresses West Palm Beach holistically, considering urban, cultural, social, economic, and environmental aspects. In order to connect the urban vision with a coherent design, we have to look into the different places and programs to carefully identify their potential. The new waterfront is an extraordinary opportunity to reconnect the city to the water, making good use of West Palm Beach's spectacular location. The Great Lawn, already a central piece in the city's urban life, will become the urban living room of West Palm Beach. The Meyer Amphitheater will be the ultimate space for great urban events and all kinds of cultural activities. The alleyways will undergo a rapid activation process, ranging from temporary interventions to the development of permanent structures to host new programs. The former Banyan Garage is reimagined as a new focal point for activities, attracting business and talent to create knowledge, cultivate culture, and foster innovation. Open Shore provides a set of tools to reimagine these places and positively shape the urban transformation of the downtown. Okay, so thank you very much. That's it. Um, okay, we have to, um, I think, you know, cities have been very impermeable for many years. It's about kind of just getting rid of the water, just getting rid of the water. And actually we have to start, um, you know, working in the other way, uh, absolutely. Like, you know, how can we retain water in place? How can we work with that water? Uh, and as I was saying, every single project that we're dealing with water, like, it's about making more porous, more permeable, more permeable. We have to bring uh, porosity into the cities. We have to contain the water. We have to work with the water locally. And that is already connected to the green because the minute that you have more water, you can create more green. And that is not only, again, preserving water, but also creating more green infrastructure and therefore lowering down the temperature, cleaning the air, etc. So everything is connected. But for years, the approach to the cities was about efficiency, getting rid of the water as soon as possible, and it should be the other way around, absolutely. Is thank that responding, you. Evelina? Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.